Welcome everyone. I'm Cheryl Miller, director of the HerTalk Foundation, and I'm pleased to be joined this evening by Professor Greg Wiener for our latest HerTalk conversation. Professor Wiener, like our subject tonight, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, is a man of ideas and of action. He is provost and associate professor at Assumption College, founding director of the Moynihan Center for Scholarship and Statesmanship, and a visiting scholar at AEI. Before his academic career, he spent nearly two decades in DC working as a political aide, consultant, and writer. And finally, fun fact, he stars in his own comic strip, Laws and Sausages. This summer, Professor Wiener is teaching a virtual course for Hertog on Edmund Burke. We're delighted he agreed to take on double duty today to discuss a contemporary example of Burkean statesmanship, the politician and public intellectual Pat Moynihan. So I'll begin by asking a few questions and then I'll recognize four political studies fellows who have submitted advanced questions to Professor Wiener. Our wider audience is also invited to submit questions via Zoom um, Q&A feature, which you'll find on the bottom um, menu bar. And you can start submitting questions right now. There's no need to wait. So Greg, to get started, your biography of Moynihan is titled American Burkean. In what ways was Moynihan a Burkean and how did that Burkeanism moderate or modify his liberalism? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, Moynihan, uh, I, call a, I call Burke a conserving reformer. And uh, Moynihan, I think, operated in much the same way. But Burke was known as, as one of the great reformers of his day, but also someone who, uh, who sought to uh, conserve principles of the regime. Uh, his all, not all his principles were, were the same as, as Moynihan's, obviously, and I, I would not, I would hesitate to attribute uh, everything Burke to, to Moynihan, but I, I do think there is uh, uh, something very compatible about their commitments to both living at the intersection of ideas and action and to um, uh, the, uh, the very deep and important principle of prudence. And what I had was that rare thing which so many Hurtog students aspire to, he was an intellectual and public service. So how was he able to bridge those two lives, active and contemplative? And what can we learn from his career about the relationship of ideas and action in political life? Yeah, I think there, there's a wonderful uh, tradition of the scholar statesman, and uh, the, but particularly in the West, and that goes back to, you can take that back to Cicero, even Plato served in, in, um, uh, in government briefly. Um, certainly we have an American tradition going back to John Adams and James Madison and so forth, of uh, people whose, whose uh, scholarship is informed by their statecraft and whose statecraft is in, informed by their scholarship. And I think what they're able to do is avoid being what uh, Burke feared, which is um, uh, what he called metaphysical politicians. Uh, their ideas are very grounded uh, because of their, their breadth of exposure and uh, experience. And in, in Moynihan's case, a, a wonderful um, a range of interests. Uh, they are able to cultivate uh, the, the essence of prudence or an essence of prudence, which is judgment. Moynihan had a, just an uncanny ability uh, not only to foresee um, uh, how things would play out and to foresee problems, but also uh, to reconceive problems in new ways that, that illuminated different, uh, different dimensions of them. Yeah, so on the subject of prudence, the great historian Richard Brookheiser, who we're actually going to hear from next week, um, recently challenged you on Twitter about the value of prudence in understanding statesmanship. And he suggested that um, appeals to prudence are base stealing, which you inform me is legal in baseball, um, but maybe not in philosophy. And so maybe even he said tautology. So his challenge to you was, isn't prudence this hefty bag word that we just stuff whatever makes things work? So how do you respond to that? Well, it, it can be. I would argue that that's not real uh, prudence in any, certainly not in any Burkean sense, not in an Aristotelian sense, not in uh, uh, the sense in which Aquinas means it. Uh, it, it is for Aquinas a cardinal uh, virtue, and it is grounded, uh, I, I think, most importantly in the virtue of humility. Uh, the, the belief uh, on Burke's account that, uh, that the, what he calls the collected reason of ages contains more wisdom than any single uh, uh, metaphysician or philosopher or, the, or, or uh, otherwise intelligent individual at any one moment in time. So I think it's a deeply moral commitment uh, 
Uh, prudence is not an end unto itself. It is a means on, on the classical account, and I think on Burke's account as well, of attaining good ends. So pr prudence is not, uh, Aristotle distinguishes prudence from what he calls mere cleverness, uh, which, which I think uh, would be a little bit closer to the, the point of, of uh, base stealing. I, the other point I would, I would make there is that Burke is not seeking to articulate a fully uh, formed political philosophy. In fact, he, that is the antithesis of what he's, what he's trying to do. He believes that politics needs to be fitted to circumstance and, and to what he calls the infinite variety of human concerns. And a t question on um, contemporary matters. So during the recent protests um, associated with the Black Lives Matter, um, Juneteenth, they, we've been toppling statues of Confederate generals and leaders, but also of founding fathers like Jefferson Washington, Union General. Um, and so these have all been vandalized, taken down in some cases, or also removed um, by democratic decision making. Um, and one argument that people make um, in favor of removing these statues is that we shouldn't be elevating historical figures at all, that they're human beings, they're flawed, or complicit, many of them are complicit in grave injustices. And instead, what we should elevate are ideas like freedom or equality. Um, so as the author of a critical but largely admiring biography of Daniel Patrick Monahan, who I think you wrote about in part to use him as an example of what statesmen could be or should be, um, how do you think about this? Should we be seeking exemplary lives in our histor history and how so? Um, or are we just uh, partaking in kind of naive hero worship? Well, I, I, I mean, the, 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 there can be a, a bit of truth in both of those. I, I do think there is a tendency in the American tradition to engage in hero worship of uh, who, whomever occupies the the, uh, the presidency at any one given moment of time, and that that it, and and uh, hero contempt as well. Uh, that has to do with the exaggeration of the presidency in our in our constitutional system. But I think there's a larger point here about memory. Uh, and I would, I would draw a distinction between um, uh, people who are, uh, all, all statesmen have uh, great virtues and great sins. That's, that's simply part of being uh, involved in, in large events. Um, it, it's also part of uh, the nature of changing standards. So I think there's a, there's a significant difference in my mind between honoring those who in the balance of things uh, we consider to be national heroes and honoring people who are really known for nothing but their, uh, but their defects. And I, I think there is a particular uh, perversity, if I can put it that way, in naming military bases after um, uh, men whose only real contribution to history was taking up arms against the, uh, the United States. But that to me is in a, in a different category. What, what is more troubling I think we, we witnessed this uh, Friday uh, evening when in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco when there was a bust of, of Ulysses S. Grant uh, that was uh, toppled along with, uh, uh, with a couple of others. There, there, there's an attitude that freezes the individual at the moment of his or her worst sin. So uh, the, it, in Grant's case, by the way, it's not even an accurate description, but, but the description is that he, he w was briefly a uh, slave owner. So setting aside the, the, the inaccuracies there, um, th 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 there's no sense that life is a process of education and redemption and, and uh, in both progress and, and regression. And I, I think what it reveals is that the, the, the purpose of uh, uh, this particular crowd of the, the, um, uh, the, the de-platformers, as they've been called, is not to persuade, it is to punish. Because if you persuade someone to think uh, in a different way, they are still frozen in time at the, uh, at the moment of the, the sin that preceded it. I would just say briefly that, that, that there's an inherent problem with that, and we saw it in the, the French Revolution which is if your philosophy is grounded in the, in the fact that, that moral standards are constantly improving and becoming more enlightened and um, that uh, everyone is to be judged by the, by the here and now, not by the totality of their lives, not by, uh, the stand, not, not by the context of their times, that, then it is inevitable that the people who toppled those statues uh, Friday night are going to be considered villains uh, by the standards of tomorrow. There, there, it is inconceivable to me uh, 
that some of those smartphone videos were not filmed on phones that were made under atrocious uh, labor conditions. And, and it is inconceivable to me that some of them didn't burn fossil fuels on the way to the protest and, and so on and so forth. So it, it, it is, uh, as Nathaniel, Nathaniel Hawthorne said in a very famous story, it's a, it's a tendency to, to uh, fling others onto the flame and then, and then uh, fling themselves. Yeah, maybe you could say a little bit more on that last point. And one of the um, themes of your Burke course in particular is this kind of tension between understanding things in their context and in their circumstances, but also the dangers of historicizing. And that's something right, Strauss famously um, charges Burke with, is being a historicist. Um, and so how do you think about those two things in relation with each other? How do we avoid the dangers of historicizing while also paying proper attention to the circumstances or context in which an action occurs. Right. So I think the, the question for Burke is not whether there is an objective moral order. That he clearly believes that there, that there is. Uh, the, the question is, what is the best means of discovering it? And confidence in, in one individual's reason in the here and now, especially one detached from uh, the, the complexity of human life like, uh, like um, academics might, might uh, tend to be, uh, is, is going to be less uh, prudent and, and probably more prone to abuse than looking at, at the, the accumulation of custom is what Burke calls the collected reason of ages. So I, I, I think uh, Strauss is off base in that, uh, in that uh, charge. Uh, it, it, one could read Burke in a way that emphasizes uh, changing standards, but, but when, you, when you read Burke carefully, he is always talking about uh, reforming in order to restore, in order to reanimate the, the original principles of a regime. Right. And let's return back to Daniel Patrick Moynihan. So in a recent essay for National Affairs on morality and moralism in American politics, you quote this very striking observation from Moynihan, quote, no one is innocent after the experience of governing, but not everyone is guilty. So what did Moynihan mean by this and what does it tell us about the nature of political life? Yeah, so this is one of my favorite uh, aphorisms from, from Moynihan and he wrote it in a book about the, uh, the guaranteed income, which he nearly uh, got through in the, when he served in the Nixon administration. The, I, I think what he means, and this is a, a deeply Burkean point, is that governing involves uh, choices, which was something that, that President Kennedy said that, that Senator Moynihan often quoted. Uh, and those choices, as Burke would say, are, are often between uh, necessary evils. They're, 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 they're very rarely in, in practical politics choices between an unvarnished good and a, and a very obvious evil. So in that sense, no one is, is innocent. But to be guilty, I think, in, on Moynihan's reading, is, is to be guilty of a certain negligence or, or, or ill will uh, that, 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 is, um, that, that is different from the fact that, that immersing oneself in the complexities of political life and making some of the decisions that are unavoidable in political life leaves everyone uh, marked by it, uh, but, but not in a way that... that um, uh, that makes everyone morally culpable. Yeah, I, right now, kind of our attitude toward politicians is that they're all guilty. Um, and what you just said about um, freezing people in the moment of the worst thing that they ever said or done, that's something that's certainly been exacerbated by our current social media era, where you dig up a tweet from a candidate's um, teenage years, and that's used to kind of as a weapon to cudgel them. And it's hard to imagine someone like um, Senator Moynihan with this vast paper trail, many things that he saw, said, some of them provocative, like imagine him getting elected today. Um, and yet despite, or maybe because of this process, we're constantly disappointed in our politicians um, and cynical about them and their moral rectitude. Um, so what do you think? Or do we hold our politicians to too high or too low a standard? Well, I, I think maybe a little bit of both. Uh, I, I think the, uh, certainly the, the search for uh, sin, if I can put it that way, which, which uh, as Solzhenitsyn said, the, the, the line between good and evil runs through every human heart, and there, there are a few of us who have not uh, made uh, mistakes, or, or even if not willful mistakes, simply things we would, we would judge differently under different circumstances. 
So the, the, the practice of uh, defining people uh, by, a, by uh, again, freezing them at time, in time at the moment of their worst sin rather than taking uh, a full account of their own lives is inevitably going to leave us disappointed. And it feeds what I think is one of the most corrosive uh, aspects of uh, political life. And, and Burke said this. Uh, which is uh, sort of cheap cynicism that says everyone is corrupt and and uh, uh, and what's the point and uh, so forth. So I, I, I don't think we should too easily give our admiration uh, to to politics. I, I, I do think hero worship is a um, uh, is a temptation uh, that, that that we should uh, in most cases resist. Um, but I, I can tell you from my own time working in politics that, that uh, most most people are. Uh, Moynihan was certainly an extraordinary man, but but uh, most people serving in Congress are are um, relatively normal people. Uh, at least this is. I regret to say a generation ago that I was doing this, but uh, relatively normal people trying to do their best and, um, and, and allowing them more space to do that, I think would make our politics work better. Great. All right. We're going to hear from some political studies students who've um, submitted some advanced questions for you. And the first student we're going to hear from is Dominic Pino of George Mason University. All right, Dominic. Hello, Professor Weiner. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Um, my question is about uh, about Moynihan. So uh, Moynihan occupied the niche of Republicans' favorite Democrat for much of his public life. Uh, that praise from the opposition could earn him ire from his own side, as we see in the reactions to his report on the black family. While it's a bit of a stretch, I think you could say Edmund Burke, Edmund Burke could have reasonably been called the, the Tories' favorite Whig. Uh, he was often at loggerheads with his own party, as we see in the appeal from the new to the old Whigs. Is there something about being the opposition's favorite that refines one's statesmanship? There's certainly something about being in opposition that that, that uh, refines what what Burke would call a sort of honorable partisanship. I, I think probably in both Moynihan's and Burke's case uh, cases, I should say, the, um, the 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 sense of being the other side's favorite person uh, came later. Right. So, so uh, it, one thing that's very important to understand about Moynihan is that he was from beginning to end a New Deal liberal through and through. Right. So uh, he, he once said that, the, that he used to tell his students when he was a professor that the most important thing you could know about uh, um, a person's political identity is what year they were born. Moynihan was born, I, I think, in 1927, which, of course, is, means he grew up during the Depression. And for him, uh, being an FDR Democrat w was was almost uh, an ethnic identity. Uh, so, uh, in 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 uh, Burke writes of an honorable partisanship uh, as well. So, um, you know, I think one way to think about Moynihan is as a gadfly, which is to say he was uh, sort of got under the skin in a Socratic kind of way of of uh, whomever was serving as as president. I can't think of. Uh, I'd have, to, I'd have to give it some more thought, but I can't, I can't think of a single president who, uh, uh, with whom he served as a senator who, uh, who um, wouldn't have regarded him as a critic to some, uh, to some extent. Uh, but he was also a very constructive legislator, so I, I wouldn't want to view him purely in those terms. Great. Thank you, Dominic. All right, our next student is Avi Kumar, St. John's College. Avi? Uh, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, my question uh, has to do with uh, Monaghan's political longevity. Uh, Monaghan faced many controversies in his career, but uh, he nonetheless enjoyed a long political career. His political longevity uh, is particularly intriguing given his deviations from his own party. Uh, yet, as you noted in your National Affairs essay, uh, he never left to join the neoconservatives. Uh, how can we reconcile Monaghan's uh, ideological independence and his political longevity? Well, I, I think, um, so for, again, he was a, a, a loyal and a genuinely loyal New Deal liberal uh, his, whole, uh, his whole life. Um, he fiercely rejected the neoconservative label, which was, as he used to say, coined in epithet. It was, it was not meant as a compliment when it, when it uh, first uh, 
uh, came out, it, it was sort of used uh, initially to describe a generation that had rejected uh, New Deal liberalism, as uh, Irving Kristol famously said, a neoconservative is a liberal who's been mugged by reality. And, uh, you know, Moynihan, uh, I was going to say jokingly, really quite seriously said that some of them uh, left the church, by which he meant the, uh, the Democratic Party. And he said, I never did, never will, never would. Uh, so um, the, 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 the labeling, I think, is, uh, was distasteful to him. Uh, except in so far as he never had uh, any hesitation to, des to describe himself as a as a New Deal liberal, I, I would say that events since uh, his death in 2003 and since his retirement in in 2001 have changed the character uh, not just of the Democratic Party but of, but of politics overall. So the 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 ability to uh, match an intellectual life with with with, uh, th th with broad interests. In intellectual life, reflecting broad interests, with a um, what, what used to be um, a, a, even when I worked there, a, a relatively bipartisan sensibility, or more of a bipartisan sensibility in the Senate. Um, those have changed, and I, I think those those cause us to see Moynihan differently in retrospect than we would have seen him in his own day. Thank you, Avi. Next student is Deanna Scott from Yale University. Hi, um, can y'all hear me? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Hello, Professor Wiener. Um, this Hi. came up in your answer to Nico's question, but I wanted to ask about partisanship broadly. I know that Burke has explicit writings on political parties, um, but Moynihan occupies this really interesting space as a New Deal Democrat who neoconservatives try to claim as their own, just like you were talking about. Um, and he works under presidents on from both sides of the aisle. Um, but he continuously champions the same politics. Yeah, he doesn't kind of flip-flop back and forth across the aisle to keep his political position secure. Um, and that feels really alien to our kind of current politics today. So from your, your experience of both working in politics, but also your experience with Burkean thought, the more substantive and robust uh, kind of ideas on what political parties are, um, you know, in what ways was Moynihan a party man? Um, in what way, where would he fit in our political landscape today? Um, and is there a problem if we don't have a space for him? Uh, so uh, let me answer that uh, in a couple of ways. I mean, I, I always uh, hesitate to project Moynihan in into, into contemporary controversies, but you're, you're talking about uh, projecting him into our, uh, sort of how we would think about a, a person like that in a contemporary context. I, I think one of the most unfortunate things about um, contemporary politics and uh, in contemporary academia, by the way, uh, and, and Moynihan worked in both worlds, is that we have lost the capacity for nuance, uh, the, to, to process nuance, to, to, to draw insights. Uh, the, um, uh, and again, that's true in both, um, in both academics and in politics. So uh, the idea that, um, uh, that, that one might adhere to a consistent set of principles and still be a, uh, in fact, because of that, be a, be a party person, uh, is foreign to us. Now, uh, Burke had, uh, Burke's most famous essay on party is, is actually just a piece of a, of a larger essay called Thoughts on the Cause of, of the Present Discontents. And what Burke, said, what Burke rejects there is very interesting. The, 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 the uh, um, sort of bumper sticker of the time was not men, but measures. So that a principled politician was not supposed to care about who was in power, only about what was right. And Burke actually rejects this, right? And he says it, it would be a shame if in a lifetime of working alongside people toward common principles, one did not form meaningful attachments, what he called connections uh, in friendships. And I think the problem today is that we have, I don't want to say a dishonorable partisanship, but a different partisanship that is in fact based on measures. So that, um, not, not, not entirely, I mean, obviously we saw this in 2016, measures, uh, priorities of parties change, uh, but we, we are also to a certain extent, and you, you can pick your, you can pick President Obama, President Trump, whomever else, um, more interested in, in uh, um, the given policy. It can be tax cuts, it can be climate change or, or whatever else, than we are in uh, 
what I would call genuine political friendship. Cicero has a wonderful tract on, on friendship that, uh, that, that talks about this. So I think it is, uh, we are certainly partisan today, but I would say the character of the partisanship has changed in a way that, that would leave less room for a subtle thinker. And I, I do think that's a problem because most problems, uh, most issues that we face in politics are not, um, uh, are not simple. They're not, they're not on a sort of uh, uh, up or down valence. They're, they're, uh, they're complicated. All right, and we'll hear from our last um, political studies fellow before we open up Q&A to our wider audience. So please do send in your um, questions via our Q&A function. So last questioner is Clara Pizant of Toro College. Hi, Professor Wiener. Thanks for being here with us. Um, my question for you is as follows. You characterize Moynihan as a figure palatable to both conservatives and liberals seemingly because he wanted to achieve liberal aims through change gradual enough not to disturb conservative sensibilities. In all matters, but particularly race relations, does the pace of reform acceptable to, conservative, to conservatives jeopardize the justice being sought? For justice delayed is justice denied, and 400 years into the fight against racial injustice, I think we can agree that justice is long overdue. Yeah, it's an excellent question, and it reminds me of something that, that Moynihan wrote, which is that the pace of change from the point of view of the individual seeking it is always slower than the pace of change uh, from the point of view of history. Uh, and I, what, what I think is important, if I can depart from Moynihan for just a minute, is that we have I, I, the, the, the two most important texts in my mind on the role of law in American society are, are Lincoln's Lyceum Address in 1838, in which he says, you can never break the law for any reason whatsoever. Uh, maybe lose a little wiggle room, but not much. And King's letter from Birmingham jail, in which he says it can sometimes be uh, just to, to break the law so long as you accept the, the punishment. Uh, these are often seen as contradictory. And it, 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 instead, it seems to me that a republic needs both. Uh, that a republic needs a theory of governing and a theory of, of uh, protest but I think it is important that they not become the same thing. So I, I would cite as an example of that, that uh, I, I think many of the protests against police brutality have been uh, um, uh, very important, uh, raising very important issues uh, that, uh, that uh, and, and, and obviously um, uh, protesting inexcusable uh, and abhorrent uh, abuses. But when the, um, the, the crowd in Minneapolis had the, first of all, the mayor, who's a civil rights lawyer, um, booed him out and sort of marched him out of a protest because uh, he said, I do not support the full abolition of the police right now. So full, right? He was apparently open to partial. And um, right now, meaning apparently he was open to it uh, in, in some period of time, they started yelling uh, shame and get out and so forth. And uh, the next day or the day after that, the, a veto-proof majority of the city council stood in front of the protesters and signed a, a pledge to abolish the, the uh, police. Now, I, I would submit that the uh, underlying claims of the uh, protesters, which are that the, 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 there is a, uh, there are serious racial problems in the criminal justice system, and serious problems uh, in the police system that require reform are something that need to be heard by uh, politicians and deliberated upon and the full views of the community taken into account. But when, when, when that becomes instantaneous uh, through, through essentially um, a theory of, of protest and a theory of governing colliding like that, I, I think one gets bad results. And, and the last thing I would say about that is I don't think it tends to be good for the cause of, of uh, racial justice because I, or, or any cause, uh, because those gains tend to be fleeting if they are not based in genuine persuasion of the broader uh, community. Great. Now we're going to hear from our wider audience. Our first questioner is um, Professor Benjamin Kleiderman. Is he, is he going to ask me about the book chapter that I owe him? Uh, we'll find out. He may take this opportunity to chastise you. I didn't know it was going to be video, so I just had it written 
question. Can can you just read the question? Because I'm not ready to be on video. Sure. Not if it pertains to the book chapter, but otherwise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Should Moynihan have a statue? And if so, do you think it could happen? Uh, uh, yes, I think he's I, I think he's worthy of honor in that way. I think that um, uh, we certainly have statues to to less honorable people, but, but um, I, I, I think um, you know I, I do think a, a, a um, an interval should pass before evaluating the fullness of someone's life. But but uh, when he has been gone for nearly uh, two decades now, and do I think it would be possible? No. Uh, uh, in the current political climate, the um, uh, again, we have a tendency to freeze things in time at the moment. Uh, in, in Moynihan's case, I would say this wasn't a, a matter of his worst sin. It was simply his biggest controversy, uh, which was the, the, uh, the Moynihan report on the state of the, the African-American uh, family. Uh, which I would uh, commend to everyone's reading here, whether you, whether you agree with it uh, or not. Uh, was wildly misconstrued in his day, and and uh, th th there have been many um, sociologists who said it. Uh, I, I think William Julius Wilson was one who said that that it froze the reaction to it froze scholarship on the on the topic for a generation. Uh, so uh, do, do do I the, the question of of whether to honor someone has to do with with uh, nuance and balance, being able to take the the uh, some of the the totality of of a person's life into account. I don't, uh, I disclose my biases, I don't think there's anything even vaguely dishonorable in Moynihan's uh, record. I'm sure there are things that, 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 that there are things that, um, you know, a, a 2020 sensibility would say that a 1965 one would, would not, for example. Uh, but but even were there some controversy there? So for, well, actually, I'm sorry, I'm Ben. I'm I'm going on too long here. But uh, the um, uh, on the the 50th anniversary of the Moynihan report, Tanahasi Coates uh, wrote a blistering uh, critique of it that noted that that Moynihan had voted for the 1994 uh, crime bill. Now Moynihan was one of 99 senators who voted for the 1994 crime bill. We're hearing more about this in the context of, of uh, Biden. The, 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 the federal crimes are not uh, uh, primarily responsible for, the, for what is the genuine problem, I think, of mass incarceration. Uh, but, but, but again, I think that there's a temptation to, to, to revisit contemporary controversies uh, with, with no attention to nuance or, or context at all. All right, our and next- I'll have uh, that chapter to you soon, Ben. <laughs> Um, our next um, questioner is Luke Foster, our teaching assistant for this summer's program. Not for your course, sadly. Graduates for grant. Luke, are you over here? I, I am. Uh, hi, Professor. Hi. Uh, one of the surprising features I found in your praise of Moynihan as Burkean is that his formative political role in the 60s and 70s was precisely as a technocrat, a, a policy wonk with great skills in interpreting and applying data. Yet Burke's contempt for political men of letters and literary cabals is today often read as a rejection of technocracy in favor of deliberation in legislatures, or perhaps even just in favor of conventional wisdom. Do you think that's a misreading of Burke, or is Moynihan Burkean despite but not because of his, his technocracy? Uh, I think it's a misreading of Moynihan, actually. I, I would not classify him as a technocrat, Cer certainly someone who relied on uh, uh, on social science and on data, but but in order to make prudential judgments. So w one of the most uh, important things uh, in my mind to understanding Moynihan, because Moynihan is often understood in, in those terms as somebody who would crunch numbers and figure out solutions and so on and so forth, is that Moynihan said that the value of social science was not in the formulation, but rather the evaluation of of uh, social policy. So you use your best judgment to, to, uh, to craft legislation and then social science could tell you whether it was working. Now, social science could also on Moynihan's account lead you to uh, absurdity. So he, he uh, had a famous essay, I think in the New York Times that had, that where he, he crunched the numbers and he established a, uh, a very high correlation between math skills and proximity to the Canadian border. So um, uh, his, his proposal, tongue-in-cheek, of course, is sort of uh, Jonathan Swift-like, 
was that we should move all schools to North Dakota and therefore we will get, we will all get uh, better math skills, which, which is of course absurd. So I, I think Moynihan was, was very aware of both the, the uses and the limits of, uh, of uh, social science. The other thing I would say about that is something to which I alluded earlier, which is Moynihan was a master of the lost art of the learned generalization. So in academia today, you cannot uh, generalize in any way. You can't look at a set of data or a set of historical facts and be like a Gordon Wood or whomever else and, 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 and say, here are some patterns or, uh, that I see. Because it, it, Gordon Wood actually, um, uh, I heard Gordon Wood say this once, because some graduate student will then uh, uh, get a doctoral degree on a dissertation that said, actually, the voting patterns in Westchester County, New York, between 1790 and 1792 uh, were, were incongruent with the thesis. So uh, when, when Moynihan wrote things like Defining Deviancy Down, was one of his most famous essays, uh, those were, those were uh, I, I think, deeply learned and, and um, general in a very grounded way. All right, our next um, questioner from the audience is Luke Phillips, an alum of the Hertog Foundation. Uh, howdy, uh, Professor Weiner. First off, thank you for uh, all you've done to uh, interpret Moynihan in a way that uh, brings his wisdom to conservative world. It's been great and uh, it's influenced a lot of us. Uh, my question is, can you compare and contrast Daniel Patrick Moynihan's career in scholarship and statesmanship to Henry Kissinger's contemporaneous career in scholarship and statesmanship. Did either of them do it right? Was either superior in their practice of that very Hertogy lifestyle? Um, and uh, do you have any general comments and assessments of that? This is a very fraught issue uh, because Kissinger actively undermined Moynihan when Moynihan was ambassador to the, uh, to the UN and, and uh, uh, sought to go around him in, in many ways. And they, as you, you saw this like, in, in the film, uh, they battled over the Zionism as racism uh, resolution. Um, so I am not a uh, historian, and I don't want to uh, play one on TV or on, on Zoom here. I would actually, uh, given the, the sort of general policy of realism, I, I would put um, Kissinger more in the technocratic mode than I would put, uh, than I would put Moynihan. Mo Moynihan... Uh, you know, Kissinger's project was finding ways to live with the Soviet Union. Moynihan in 1979, uh, in some ways at the uh, height or near the height of the Cold War, said these people are going to collapse in the next decade. Uh, and, um, and, and of course, that literally within a decade, uh, the, uh, the Berlin Wall came down. So uh, I, I think Moynihan had, in, in an important sense, a larger attention uh, to the sweep of history and to the tendencies uh, that, were, that were emerging. So one, one of the very important things that Moynihan saw uh, emerging was, was that the, the Soviet uh, empire had suppressed ethnic difference. And the, the, you know, the expectation of Marxist thought is that all workers are the same and, and uh, mark, uh, workers would have no differences of uh, opinion uh, uh, based on ethnicity and, and so forth. And that, and what Moynihan said in 1979 in, in Newsweek magazine was the Soviet Union is going to disintegrate in this de decade and disintegrate along, along uh, ethnic lines. Thank you. All right, our next questioner is Gabe Whitbread, your TA for the BERT course. Gabe? Uh, so I was struck by the fact that Martin Luther King apparently expressed appreciation for the report, but was unable to endorse it out of concern about backlash sure. from more radical parts of his own movement. And it seems clear that this sort of hesitation and fear continues to be a problem in our current politics. So if Martin Luther King can't pass a political purity test, then what hope do any of us have um, who can afford to be nuanced? Uh, so do you think that that a willingness to get into the nuances of painful problems is an essential sort of integrity for true leadership or does prudence dictate playing politic and lying low on which approach does Moynihan's legacy impart to us? Right. So I, I would say, I, I would actually reverse this. I would say prudence dictates dealing with complexity. Um, in King's case, when he, he says, when Mrs. Moynihan describes him saying, I'm sorry, I can't publicly, 
support you. I, I don't know the details of what went into that uh, calculation. It, it may be that, that King had, had calculated the, that, uh, it, so to speak, his eyes were on the prize and that there were greater goods at stake than, uh, than this. I, I, I do think that uh, there is a uh, there's a serious pro so I, I, I guess what I'm saying again, is that that doesn't strike me as a purity test uh, so much as a um, uh, sort of an ex extraordinarily heated atmosphere in which society was was inflamed uh, literally anyway um, in, in which um, uh, King decided for whatever defensible or, or or less defensible reasons not to engage. Um, what, what strikes me now is the incapacity of our political conversation to accommodate not only nuance, but generalization. So, so in uh, the Moynihan report, by the way, is based on, on uh, heavy data, uh, lots of data sets that, by the way, were drawn were, were, uh, from before the war on poverty. So Moynihan, the rest of his life, uh, resisted the idea that, that anti-poverty programs contributed to the uh, decline of the, 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 the um, uh, a breakup of the African American family, um, but but there are also um, sweeping generalizations, but in, in a positive way about the legacy of slavery and uh, um, so on and so forth. And and I think um, there are certainly um, uh, parts of the report that, to our contemporary ears, sound. Um, uh, you know, I mean, there, there, there are references to gender roles that, that don't apply in, in society anymore and, and so on and so forth. But, but um, the, the, the key in things like that is being able to take account of the totality and, and walk away with a message, rather, walk away with a conclusion or, or an opposition uh, without fixating on, uh, with, with that sort of a search and destroy me uh, mentality that says, I'm going to find the worst thing here pick on it. And I would say, by the way, that the academic culture generally has contributed to this, uh, to this mentality in the political culture, because uh, the academic culture for um, at least a generation, probably a couple, has, has been all about deconstruction. It's been all about, um, you know, we, I was mentioning to the Burke class the other day that I despise the phrase critical thinking, right? Because we, what it tends to mean is picking things apart until there is nothing left. It, 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 so it's, it's not, a, it tends, I mean, it has a noble meaning, but it, but it tends to mean uh, just tearing down and not, not, uh, not building back up. So Professor Weiner, um, one of the things that you work on at AEI um, with the great Yuval Levin, also a Hertog faculty member and be teaching later this summer for us, uh, but one is um, looking at Congress as a branch, in particular, the decline of Congress as a legislative and deliberative body. And so I'm curious, I mean, it's probably too much to expect that all of our senators will be Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Um, and so we'll, we'll put that off the table. But nonetheless, it does seem that there is a kind of decline um, among our elected officials and what they're capable of from bring to the table. And are those reasons mostly institutional? Is some of the things you've already talked about and the way that Congress has changed um, and the way partisanship, the parties govern themselves? Or is this more a question of kind of the character of the people that we now attract to office? Uh, I think it's a combination. I, I think uh, there, there are probably a lot of good people who can't find the space to express complexity. Uh, the average soundbite, um, I, I don't know what it is now, but used to be down to seven seconds from, from upwards of, of 60. And uh, try saying, I'm certainly not doing it right now, try saying anything of substance in, in uh, seven seconds, other than I'm a good guy and, and, and uh, you're a bad guy. So I, I would hesitate to, um, uh, to, to judge every member of Congress, uh, uh, or, or even the bulk of them is incapable so much as whether there is room in the political conversation. Uh, for uh, what what they uh, for for nuance, I do think there are some institutional uh, reasons for this. Uh, the um, you know one phenomenon that's been talked about is the so-called Gingrich senators that the path to sen the Senate used to be being a a governor uh, or a, a prominent civic leader of some sort, and now you'd normally start in the House and then move to the Senate, where in the in the House of course is uh, by, by design emphasizes much sharper 
debate and, and partisan cohesion. Uh, I think there's some limits to that explanation, but, but there, there are, uh, but, but, but it's not a bad one. Um, the, the other point I, I would um, make there is, uh, by way of example, is the filibuster, which I'm in favor of keeping, probably. Uh, but uh, what, what, what is extraordinary is to me is that the filibuster was not really actively ideologically abused until about the past 10 or 15 years. And it's existed since the early 20th century. You, you, can, you can, you know, decide who on the playground you think started it. But the Senate made it a long, long time on institutional culture. Now, that's partly a product of institutional design. But, but when I, I'm going to start to sound like a crotchety old man, but when I worked in the Senate, it was unheard of for one senator to criticize another in public. And I used to, I was a press secretary, and I used to say the most frightening question any reporter ever asked was, how do you spell your last name? Because it meant you were going to be quoted. And, it, and the, the purpose of staff was to stay behind the scenes and, and just help out. And, and that's, that's not the case, uh, uh, that's not the case any, anymore. So I, I think the media environment, particularly the media environment that is so uh, subdivided and specialized that you can sort of live in your own uh, reality, um, so to speak, whether it's far right or far left or, or wherever else. Uh, I, I think all those things are hostile to the, the kind of nuanced and uh, prudent statesmanship we need. Sure. So unfortunately, the media reality is probably not changing and if anything, going to only trend um, further in the direction that it's already going. Um, but I mean, for members of Congress, people in elected office, maybe students, who are listening to this conversation aspiring um, to public office, like what are kind of concrete reforms that they might be thinking about, ways that Congress governs itself, ways that our elected officials think about themselves and their place in institutions that might lead to a kind of healthier statesmanship, an ability to think in that kind of nuance that you've spoken about. Right. I, I, the first thing I would say is read uh, Yuval's book, A Time to Build, because it, it's a, it, it is a wonderful account of how institutions help to form the individuals who serve in them. Uh, and um, it, 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 that part of institutional culture, I think, is, is very important. Um, the other thing I would say, and this is somewhat at odds with my uh, remarks on honorable partisanship uh, before, is that uh, the separation of powers really depends on Congress having an identity of its own, not seeing itself as sort of parliamentarians who are lined up for or against whomever is the president uh, at any one time. And, um, uh, and I think that, I, I think that Congress's failure to assert the authority that it has uh, even to the point of going to the courts and saying, could you please protect the authority that we're not willing to exercise, is, um, uh, is really responsible for a lot of the decline in constitutional norms. So the most important thing I would say is, uh, if you plan on serving in a legislature of any, any sort, is uh, remember that ambition must be made to counteract ambition, as Federalist 51 said. And that ambition, I think, in Madison's mind, is an ambition to, to exercise power. That, that uh, you know, one of the great changes that's taken place, uh, and you've all uh, talked about this, is that, that there seems to be what would have been simply empirically unimaginable to Madison, a, a sort of celebrity culture around, uh, around Congress that, that gives people reasons to serve that, that don't have to do with exercising power. And that, that I think is the, I don't have an institutional solution to that. Uh, I, I do have one that drives uh, Professor Kleinerman crazy, which is term limits. Uh, but, um, uh, but, 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 but I think that, that attitudinal change in, in members of Congress, and also, by the way, for those of you who are not aspiring to serve in politics, if voters don't expect that, don't expect institutional assertion, then it's not going to happen. Well, reading of all 11 is always good advice, um, as is reading the magazine that he edits, National Affairs, which just put out its new issue, um, which I encourage everyone to take a look at. You have an essay in that that was just posted today called Prudence, Protests, and Pandemics. Very timely title. Um, can you give us a curtain raiser and maybe whet our appetite to read more? Sure. Um, it's um, uh, the the idea that it, it's it's an interesting addition. Uh, they're always interesting, but a, but a particularly interesting addition to national affairs that that is uh, 
was, it was sort of seeking several takes on the uh, interpretations of, of recent events, particularly the, the pandemic. And I think what I, what I wanted to get across by linking both the, the pandemic and the protests to the idea of prudence is to resist uh, two things. One is the temptation of, of government by expertise. Uh, which I, I, I think is a real problem. So I, I actually opened the essay by saying that um, uh, one of the most, in all of the manic press conferences he has held, one of the most ridiculed and sensible things that President Trump has said about the pandemic is he was asked, what metrics will you use to make various decisions? And he said, the metrics right here. Okay. Now, you can doubt his judgment. I am on uh, record as having uh, said things that are less than laudatory about, uh, uh, about the president. But there is something uh, very important there, which is that the, the, the statesman, uh, the prudent statesman has to balance a lot of different priorities, a lot of different values. And it's, not as, it's never as simple as, uh, as Joe Biden said on, on Twitter, that when I'm president, we'll listen to the experts and heed their advice. And I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, I mean, if you've ever been in a faculty meeting and, and seen a room of experts who agree with each other on anything, uh, then I, I would, well, I wouldn't quite like to be invited to that meeting, but I, I would rather attend that meeting than some others. And, um, uh, and to say nothing of the fact that there are different areas of, of expertise. So that, that there, is a, there is an art of balancing uh, that um, is not given to clear cut uh, thinking or all or none thinking. And that's related to the point that I wanted to make about the protests, which is that we have, uh, I think it's a, a species of polarization that we have uh, retreated uh, behind lines that deny all complexity. So uh, the, the, we, there, there are, uh, not everybody subscribes to them, of course, but there, we have slogans like law and order or abolish the police, right? Well, th th those are, first of all, those are false choices. Uh, secondly, uh, I think one of the calling cards of, of prudence is the ability to understand that more than one thing can be true at the same time, and they can still be in tension with one another. And you have to be able to grapple with complexity. So one aspect of complexity may very well be that um, uh, I, I think one aspect of, of fact is that there's a, a, a serious uh, uh, serious discrepancies uh, along racial lines in the criminal justice system, and and, uh, um, uh, and certainly these acts of police brutality are horrendous. Um, one has to be able to to balance a recognition of that fact and a willing to willingness to listen to uh, fellow citizens who have different perspectives on uh, on uh, the American the American experience of race, uh, while also saying maybe the police are important. Right? Maybe maybe they are they may they 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 serve an important role. Maybe they need to be reformed rather than abolished. But the immediate tendency uh, in in this day and age is, if I believe in uh, if I'm on the side of the the quote unquote protesters, which is a, a term I don't even like, as it implies everyone is undifferentiated and believes the same thing. But if if I'm on the side of the protesters. I must uh, agree with and endorse everything the protesters say and or uh, 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 very few of them do. And if I'm on the side of uh, pick your slogan, law and order, or the president or whatever else, then I must condemn and deny everything the, the protesters say and do. And that, that is a, uh, I, I, I think one could not come up with a, uh, a more precise definition of a denial of, of uh, the virtue of prudence. Excellent. Well, I, I encourage everyone to take a look at that essay and the entire issue of national affairs, um, which looks to be terrific as we would expect from um, the magazine. Thank you so much for joining us, Greg. Thank you for having me.